Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the voice of reason. So today, first, I must apologize. It has been a few days since I have posted content. Now, the reason for that, uh, I am currently on a trip uh, to the Washington, D.C. area. So if you hear a, uh, a uh, rooster crow, uh, that is because right now I am a, in a fairly rural part of the state of Maryland. And I will be back to our home base in the Midwestern United States uh, towards the uh, end week. But again, for now, in the uh, state of Maryland, and uh, I will be here for a few days. So, the war continues, and it is continuing at a very intense pace. You would not hear that from the mainstream media here in the United States. The war in the Ukraine, in fact, really any wars around the world, and there are dozens right now, get very little coverage from the mainstream media news. Usually... The coverage is about, obviously, the upcoming presidential election and the thought of who actually controls the disunited states of America at this point. A vast portion of the com country, Democrat, Republican, Independent, is concerned because most do not know who, right now, is running the country. Now look, I've talked about this before. We are in a state in terms of the possibility, the very, very high risk possibility that we could enter a state of global war and see a possible nuclear exchange. Now, there has, uh, there was a book. It is called Nuclear War. And if you go over to the uh, Joe Rogan uh, podcast, I have not watched it yet. I plan on um, jumping on there and, and watching it soon. But he is interviewing the writer of the book, Nuclear War. Now, I have read the book. The, uh, the book is very interesting, whether you read or you uh, do a book on tape. Uh, highly recommend watching or reading that book. Again, Nuclear War, the writer is also on the uh, Joe Rogan uh, po podcast. It, it is a very well done book. Now back to the ongoing war in the Ukraine, or the borderlands. What's interesting is the U.S. Navy has announced that another Aegis Ashore ballistic missile defense system has come online in Poland. I'm going to read you an article here. U.S. Navy missile defense site in Poland is mission ready, NATO says. Now look, remember when the first Aegis Ashore system was deployed in Romania? You remember what was said? It was not for protecting Europe from the Russian Federation. It was designed for a possible ballistic missile attack coming from the Mideast and or Iran. Now at the same time that site was being con constructed or at the end of that site being constructed about 10 years ago, they started building a second site. Now this site in Poland is not designed to protect Europe from inbound ballistic missiles from the Middle East. So here's the article. U.S. Navy ballistic missile defense site in Poland that has been in works for more than a decade has finally been declared mission ready by NATO. This is an important step for the transatlantic security and NATO's ability to defend against the growing threat of ballistic missiles, NATO Secretary Jans Stoltenberg said Wednesday during an alliance summit in Washington. 
The missile defense site in Poland is part of a broader European shield that includes another U.S. Aegis ashore site in Romania and U.S. Navy destroyers out of Rata, Spain. An early warning mountaintop radar in Turkey manned by the U.S. Army is also part of the network. Now look, both of these sites, Poland, Romania, were former Warsaw Pact client states. Now imagine going back in time, and I've talked about this before, going back to the early 1990s, going back to the end of the 1980s, 1989, and telling the Soviet Union at that time that eventually these very high-tech weapon systems would be deployed in Poland and Romania. Would the outcome in terms of what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union, would that, would that have changed things? And I have to say, possibly. Possibly. Now, as we speak, there is more talk about the Ukrainians being accepted into NATO. It's, it's a very interesting process. On, on one hand, you hear that the Ukrainians will never be allowed into NATO, and then you hear that the possibility of NATO being, I'm sorry, the Ukraine being accepted into NATO is absolute. So, even if, hypothetically, the Ukraine is not absorbed into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it is still going to be a very robust military partner of that organization if it survives this war. And I got to tell you, from a Russian perspective, a Russian point of view, I, I would have to believe at this point the Russians do not want any entity that gravitates towards the West having power or a regime that gravitates towards the West that would be in charge of the Ukraine. Because look, the the Russians are, are very much aware that the next place for a ages ashore system would probably be the western Ukraine. Maybe near the uh, Carpathian mountain range. Very possible. Very likely. And that is why the Russians are going to continue to prosecute this war. And it is becoming more and more likely that the Russians will continue to fight for some time, possibly a year, two, three years, and look to achieve complete victory against the Ukrainians and its NATO ally. Now look, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the only reason that the Ukrainians are still in this fight is because of the massive injection of treasure and military assistance that the West, the United States, and its Western European allies have handed over to the Ukrainians. I apologize if you're hearing quite a bit of wind. It is a little windy where I'm at right now. Outside. Beautiful day out. Now just real quick, I wanted to uh, peruse some of the, uh, the headlines that we are uh, seeing here. So, allies declare Ukraine's NATO membership is irreversible. NATO allies begin transfer of F-16 jets to Ukraine. Blinken announces Ukraine getting fighter jets from Denmark and Netherlands. Ukraine war maps show successful localized counterattacks by 
Kiev. Are Russian sanctions working? Question mark. It's out of Al Jazeera. No, they're not. Norway to give Ukraine 93 million boost to air defenses, says PM. Leaked documents show Belarus factory servicing Russian helicopters, Ukraine says. Hesitation to authorize strikes deep inside Russian territory costs civilian lives. Ukrainian defense minister. I'm not sure how that makes any sense. Again, I'm going to read that. This is from the new voice of Ukraine. Hesitation to authorize strikes deep inside Russian territory costs civilian lives. Look, if they strike deeper into the Russian Federation, what do you think the Russians are going to do? I mean, there's been a series of Russian ballistic missile and cruise missile strikes over the last few days. Very large, very successful strikes. Now look, obviously uh, the uh, Ukraine is stating that a children's hospital was hit. They claim the death toll was two people and about 50 injured. Look, if the Russians had wanted to destroy that children's hospital with something like 600 children inside, there would have been no survivors. If it was the Russian goal to attack a children's hospital and destroy it, let's say hypothetically that quote-unquote children's hospital was no longer treating children, but maybe it was being used as a command and control post for the Ukrainian military. If the Russians wanted to rubbleize and destroy that building or that complex, it could have done so. But it's interesting that the only casualties are two adult males. Do you find that interesting? Do you find that odd? Again, a cruise missile strike with a warhead in excess of a thousand pounds strikes a children's hospital with 600 children and there are no children casualties? Has anyone thought about that for a second? Does that make any sense? It does not to me. So then you have to ask questions. What was at this site and what this site was being used for? Was it a site near the children's hospital that was being used by the Ukrainian military? I mean, it would make complete sense for the Ukrainians to do that. It happens during all wars. You are going to put sensitive military sites near targets or, or objectives that the enemy is not going to attack. Or it's going to have such a risk of bad PR, bad public relations, that they won't attack that site. So was this target that the Russians went after near a children's hospital, a valid target. Difficult to say. And uh, we will eventually know, but it will take some time. So that does it for today. Again, I apologize for the lack of content. I apologize for the roosters. I apologize for the wind. But more to come very, very soon. As always, thank you for joining us. Have a good day.